By the way, my Star Scout badge, I'm very proud of. I didn't make it to Eagle Scout, but you know, not everyone fills all their dreams. Well, you know, it's great to be at the Whitliff, and this photograph of me that I'm looking at right now was taken by Bill Whitliff outside his office on Baylor Street, and we've been friends for 50 years, and he's been part of my creative journey forever, and I'm, I miss him, and I'm so inspired by this place. And actually, this exhibit, the first thing I see here is a photo, I mean, a photo of me as a paper boy at the Baytown Sun, which I guess is the first experience I had of connecting to an audience with stories that I would throw the paper, usually on their porch, but sometimes on their roof and sometimes in the culvert. Um, but when I would finish my route, I would go down to a point, this is in Baytown, and I would look out and see the San Jacinto Monument, which kind of connected me to Texas history, really. And occasionally we'd find buttons and things from Mexican soldiers on the beach, on the mud. And I would see the tankers going by, the oil tankers from the ship channel, because we were in Baytown, the biggest refinery in the world then. And I would stand there and think, I'd love just to jump in the water and swim out and get on one of those ships. I don't care where it's going, Straits of Malacca, Cape of Good Hope, uh, Southampton, anywhere, and just see the world. I didn't know if I would ever get out of Baytown or what would happen or if what was in store for me or my future. And so it's, it's really interesting for me to start this exhibit looking at that picture because as we go around, we're going to see kind of the journeys that I actually did have after I left that point and um, stopped delivering the Baytown Sun and gradually found my way into other ways of telling stories and getting them to people. So there's a kind of thematic um, theme that, that picks up here with this, with this photograph. Um, and of course, that's my Little League glove, and we were, uh, went to the Little League uh, World Championships. We got beat by a team from Monterey, Mexico, who had a pitcher named uh, Angel Mejias, who was ambidextrous and could pitch either left or right-handed. And uh, Walt Disney ended up making a Disney movie about them. Yeah. And there I am with uh, all this hair, you know, that you notice is no longer here in the 70s. And I used to go to the library, um, which was two doors down from the Brunson Theater here. And I was probably the only kid in town who would sneak out of the movie theater to go to the library. But what I would also do is I went there and I went back and they had the, they had the, the serials, you know, the cliffhangers. And I was fascinated with, with the way they told those stories, you know. And also, the first movie I saw there that, I, I, that I'll never forget is Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. And it just opened a whole magical world to me. And years later, they reopened this as a kind of museum, and they gave a little opening and put my films on the marquee. So um, that's, that was a real kind of homecoming, back to where it actually began. Uh, the first movie theater I ever went to was right there. Oh, and the other thing, speaking of Baytown, this will just take a second, is there's an article here I wrote about it, but not far from here, back in Austin, is the grave of my great-great-grandmother, Nancy Doherty. And she died in 1867 uh, on their way out of uh, Dripping Springs, where they settled on the Comanche frontier. And her surviving son, James, went with his father to Missouri, and um, they started a, a, like a, I don't know, a tin mine near Joplin. And in 19, it, was, it was going out of business. It was having a tough time. And in 1901, um, James's lawyer came and said, there's oil been discovered in Spindletop. We need to go down there. And so James says, I've been to Texas once. I'm never going back. Plus, this tin mine is going to work. You should stay here. That oil thing is a pipe dream. And as it turns out, uh, his lawyer's name was Howard Hughes, and he ended up doing pretty well, and the tin mine went bankrupt. So that's pretty much a, a good metaphor for my family's investment uh, strategy. Uh, so, but as it happened, he tested his first bit 
I was used in, at, the, at the Goose Creek oil field, which is where I grew up. And in 1916, Ross Sterling um, started building the, the Humble Refinery there, which was the company town where I was throwing the paper and where I lived in the largest refinery in the world. And we were number, I think, five on the, on the when Sputnik went over, by the way, I was sitting in my uh, uh, classroom in my junior high school, which looks out over the refinery and is now actually a super fun cleanup site. And we would listen to Sputnik go over, ping, 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 every 87 minutes. And that let us know that we were, they could reach us and that we could be, we were number five or six on the top 10 targets because we were the largest refinery in the world. And then as now, oil is crucial to a lot of uh, strategic things. So, um, but my grandfather uh, then worked in the range of oil fields after World War I and met his, his wife there. My, grand, my father grew up in the oil fields as a baby. We have photographs of him in like uh, buckets in the oil fields. My father then went to work at Humble in the refinery, and later my sister went to work for Exxon um, in, um, after she went to Harvard Business School. So we have multiple generations in oil. Uh, none of us ever decided or, or owned an oil well or made any money particularly, but it's been interesting to be present at the age of oil. And when I was growing up, um, the engineers and people who had come after the war were on a mission. They were going to make the world a better place because they were on the cutting edge of developing this amazing new invention, plastics. Um, and their generation before them had done these amazing things with oil and with, and they made the T, toluene and TNT. They developed a, a high, aviation, high octane aviation fuel there, which helped win World War II. And now they were winning the whole effort to make civilization a better place, that oil would not only make our lives better, but the plastics would transform them. And of course, the irony of that is they did, but now um, it doesn't seem quite like such a good idea. And what else is here? Oh, rice. There's a picture of Larry McMurtry down there in his creative writing class. And I took that class in 1965. Oh, the other thing is I came to Rice just as Larry McMurtry had come to Rice as a math major. And he failed Math 100, which was the introductory calculus class. And so did I. So um, I decided to try something new. And by that time, I decided to major in history or English. And I took Larry's... Um, writing class, and he was reading from his work in progress, the last picture show. Um, and I, I listened to him with just stunned, because I spent a lot of time in that little library in Baytown reading, and all the books I've read were set somewhere else, written by someone else. And here was Larry writing about a high school that I recognized, about people I knew. Um, and I thought, you can do that? You can actually write about that? And that seed he planted in me was what, after I got back from Vietnam, um, I watched the movie of The Last Picture Show. And I was in uh, Annapolis, Maryland at the Naval Academy. And when it came out and Hank Williams started to sing, and I just thought, I'm going back to Texas. I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm going back there. I ended up going to Oxford and um, that was really interesting because that opened the world to me and I fell in with a, a family of journalists, the Coburns. And the, the, the father of my friends had started his own um, uh, newsletter or magazine in the 30s to report on appeasement and, and the slide of England into war, it's appeasement of, of fascists. He was very against them and fought in the Spanish Civil War. So not only had he had all these adventures that I'd only read about, but he had become an independent journalist and started his own publication. <laughs>